Welcome to episode 34 of Rail Talk. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds. And incoming is part two of our conversation with Tinky, who we now can say is named Tony Kobitz. This is the biggest reveal since, since Geraldo going into Al Capone's vault, except this one had a lot more substance to it. And that's still to come here on part two. John, welcome. Jonathan Green, general manager at DJ's Table. Joe, by the time this is airing, you and I are going to be in a different location. We're going to be down at uh, at Ocala trying to find some inventory for next year. But I know there's going to be a lot of buzz about these two shows, the previous one and this one, down in Central Florida. As promised, when we split last week's conversation on Super Trainers, there's lots more to come from our conversation with Tink and now for the first time, Tony. So we're going to get back and right back into that discussion. A lot of great stuff still to come. Uh, we're going to touch on the NTA's first stated goal as well. So check it out. First voice you're going to hear is that of Tink slash Tony Kobitz. Here's the rest of our discussion. Tony, I'm curious as to your list, and this is your opinion, but I'm curious as to your list of who you would consider a super trainer right now? I was asked the same question. You <clears throat> you referenced Tom Ryan. And uh, as some who follow my Twitter account know, I have I had a recent discussion with uh, Tom Ryan that I thought was was good. It was uh, it was cordial. It was useful. Um, and I give him a lot of credit because mm -hmm. he is clearly a a Baffert uh, supporter, right. and the vast majority of of that uh, type uh, have a tendency to go the ad hominem route, and he did not, and engaged me in uh, in a good uh, a good discussion. So he asked me back on the first of the month, what constitutes a quote super trainer, and although I didn't come up with a list. Uh, in, in, in some sense, I did say this, that in 2023, Todd Pletcher, Brad Cox, Chad Brown, Bob Baffert, Steve Asmussen, and Bill Mott won 38% of the 440 graded races run in the United States and 57% of the grade one races. So this is one way of getting at the answer to the question. Of course, I could also take a look at the number of starts, the number of uh, wins, uh, and so on. Um, and and maybe then you know the list would expand to some extent. And it includes uh, you know under uh, using different criteria, it would include uh, trainers who are not household names. Um, for those who are not in the game, like say Jamie Ness, who uh, saddles a lot of horses and that kind of thing. Well, th I think that those kind of trainers are also problematic given the numbers. Um, but I think that the, it's it's a more uh, uh, difficult and complex problem with the high profile trainers who are uh, dominating the major race tracks and the graded races. Um, the grade one races, uh, as those numbers uh, illustrate, uh, I think that that it, it is um, a serious problem. And I also both of you made really excellent points and and have really added a lot to, to what I started out with on this topic. Um, I, the one thing I want to uh, add is that I think that um, one of the silly complaints, or if you even want to uh, give it the dignify it by calling it an argument that, oh, this is America, it's capitalism. And, uh, and, you know, we have a right to give our horses to whoever we want. And those trainers have a right to, to take as many horses as, as they want, et cetera, et cetera. Th that's not, I don't consider that to be a serious argument. And the simple reason that I say that is because a big part of the reason why the major sports in the U.S., uh, Major League Baseball, the National Basketball Association, the National Football League, have been so wildly successful is because they have used, if you want to use loaded words, a form of socialism in how they 
uh, restrict salaries and so on. Uh, they have attempted to create at least some sort of semblance of parity in their leagues because they know that it's crucial to uh, keeping interest and expanding interest in their products. And the racing industry has done the opposite. It has allowed increased concentration of not just numbers of horses, but quality of horses over several decades now. And I don't believe, of course, I'm not oversimplifying it and saying it's the only variable, but I don't believe that it could ever be considered a coincidence that the trajectory, trajectory of the racing industry over the last 20 or 30 years has been precisely the opposite of the trajectory of those major sports. I think this is a significant reason why. Yeah, and, and absolutely. Tony, Go ahead, Jared. No, I was just going to, I was just going to add like I, the idea of having like a two-year-old draft is really funny to me, like at the OVS March sale. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing. And I, you know, I just use West Point as an example again, because I think we're a microcosm of the business. We have horses all over the country at a variety of different price points. And we don't have that many horses with super trainers. We have like a couple with Todd Pletcher. We have a handful with Steve Asmussen. We have none with Chad Brown. We have none with Bob Baffert. We got a couple with Brad Cox. We have a lot more numbers wise with Greg Foley, Dale Romans, Cherie DeVoe. And I think it's because we don't want to compete with ourselves. We don't want to have horses in barns that are going to be third or fourth choice, as I was saying, to get into this allowance race or to get into this stakes race. It just makes more sense for us to diversify. And I just think it would make more a lot more sense for other ownership groups to not have to compete with yourselves to get in races in a shrinking condition book, as Tank was talking about. Go ahead, John. Yeah. And Tony, the, the only thing I would, I would argue with you on on your comments is that, you know, the other sports, yes, they're growing and they're growing exponentially, especially compared to, to our, um, you know, decreasing um, industry. They have revenue sharing and revenue sharing, you know, for their signals um, allows the Pittsburgh Pirates of the world you know, in baseball to stay afloat and the Kansas City Royals of the world and teams like that, that from the small market. So, I, I understand what you're saying, but but as far as you know, as far as a, a safety net for for some of these organizations, the revenue sharing I think is really the reason why um, they're able to to put other other restrictions on on other uh, operations. But I, I, I'm digressing for a second. You mentioned you mentioned Tom Ryan, and and I'm going to use him as an example of somebody who um, drank the Kool Aid. Okay, he is he is a big Baffert supporter, and and look. The, Baffert's done right by by their organization. There's there's no reason for him not to you know be excited about it. Whether or not he sees the other side of the equation is a, is you know a different argument, and you'd have to have that argument with him. But here's a here's a perfect example of somebody who has all the winning cards in their hand. All all he had to say, all Tom had to say was, "Hey Tink, you know Bob Baffert has won you know Grade One races with less expensive horses." And he doesn't have to have the million dollar horse to win a race or the two million dollar horse to win a race. And he could have cited examples, but he went too far. And I think in the argument with you, he wrote down all these horses that have won triple crown races and then tried to slide across saying, well, this horse only cost a thousand dollars, Medina Spirit. This horse only cost a small amount of money, you know. And and you and you countered and said, well, let's backtrack for a second. This horse wasn't really a thousand dollars; it was thirty thousand, which isn't a big significant. This horse wasn't no money, you know, bought at, at the sale. It, they bought the horse nine, for nine hundred thousand dollars the month before the Derby. So, like, he he had a winning hand. He just overplayed it by trying to say my guy is so good that he's doing it with horses that cost a thousand dollars. You don't have to say that. You just can say. My guy's really good. He's won all these races. And yes, he's won them with million dollar horses, but he's also won them with, with less expensive horses as well. And I think that's where, for me personally, that's where I get pissed off because it's like you have to be able to see both sides of the argument and you don't have to overplay your hand to impress me that Bob Baffert knows how to train horses. He does know how to train horses. But in this case, to use your term, Tink, I think Tom Ryan pushed the envelope of the argument, just like you've said that. Bob Baffert pushes the envelope when he when he trains. Is that is that a fair? You're you're the one who was battling with him. Is that a fair argument? 
Well, I, I'm a little bit uh, a little bit inclined to be a little bit more um, more kind uh, to to Tom, in part because of what I just said, which is that you know for many many years, I mean, I've been cr- critical of Baffert uh, on different topics over a long period of time, and th- there are always uh, reflexive uh, supporters who come on and say, oh, that's nonsense. He's the best trainer ever. And, you know, and, 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 you know, they, they almost never argue with the substance of what I've said, but they, they, they try to defend or claim that I'm being ridiculous. Um, I give Tom, I guess the fact that Tom, I think made a good faith effort Mm -hmm. uh, to argue the substance of the matter Maybe you know, maybe I'm giving him too much credit, but I give him a lot of credit for that. That's not that's very refreshing for me. And also, look, he's in a position in the industry. He's high profile. He's in a position in the industry. He's doing very well, uh, where he doesn't have to. He doesn't have yeah. to to argue with me about these kind of things. He can just right. completely ignore it. So I, I give him credit for those things. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a bit biased. I think he would admit, uh, ultimately, maybe only privately, that sure he's he's a bit biased. Um, but I agree with you. That um, from his standpoint, there uh, there's good reason to give horses to Bob Baffert. And this mm-hmm. touches on another important point. There's a tendency for people to uh, be critical without being thoughtful. Of course, this is typical of all social media, but but it, it happens more specifically in in the, the racing world online, uh, racing Twitter, et cetera. And uh, people have this general impression that that I only criticize uh, Bob Baffert or I only defend the jockey club. <laughs> you know, th- th- there's this this wild, you know, oversimplification of, of views that that emanates from a lack of serious engagement, typically. Um, yeah, I am a a fairly harsh qu- critic of of Bob Baffert in in a number of of areas but he has been wildly successful his record for example in the derby if you juxtapose it with Todd Pletcher's has been extremely impressive and if one is in the position of someone like Tom Ryan there's no reason to argue that that it's a mistake to give horses to Baffert. I'm not criticizing Tom Ryan. I'm much more in line with the the criticisms that you and and Joe made uh, being focused on the people that don't have the best stock giving horses to those type of trainers. Because, and, and I've managed horses over the years, I would always prefer and make the argument to the owners who I worked with that they would be better off with smaller mid-level trainers where those trainers hands and eyes are on the horses every day. I know there are a lot of great assistants out there, some of whom end up becoming terrific trainers, but it's not the same. If you're giving a horse to Steve Asmussen or Bob Baffert or Todd Pletcher, uh, there's a very good chance that for some period of time, at least, it's not going to be Todd or Bob or Steve who are feeling those legs every morning and interpreting the way the horse galloped or breezed. And if you have a trainer with 20, 30, 40 horses in their barn, it will be that trainer who is fully focused on your horses. I personally think that's a huge advantage and a big deal because let's not pretend that the horses that end up running in graded stakes are not the rare exceptions. (laughs) They're the rare exceptions. Right. The vast majority of horses, if they make it to the races, and if they're sound enough to actually have a you know a, a decent length career, decent number of starts, you know, how are they going to make their money? They're going to make their money for their owners by being developed to their full potential and managed properly. Now, who is more likely to do that with a horse that's that's intrinsically worth forty or fifty or seventy five or a hundred thousand dollars? Uh, is it going to be a super trainer who's making millions a year? 
uh, and understandably is focused on their best horses, or is it going to be the the small to medium to mid sized trainer? I'm completely with you guys on that. Right, and and as far as again because you you've managed horses before, were you surprised that all of Baffert's owners said across the board we're keeping our horses with Baffert, even though it precludes us from the Kentucky Derby. I, I personally was was surprised that every single one of them and and look, that's that's a credit to Baffert and his racing team because he obviously, you know, has has done well enough by them uh, for them to say we're going to eschew the opportunity to win the most important race up until the Breeders' Cup, arguably 150th Kentucky yeah. Derby. Too. Yeah. 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 And 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 yet every single one of them stayed. I, I think that's tremendous. I think that as an owner, I, I applaud them for making that decision. I don't know if I would have made that decision. It's a tough thing to do. Would would you as a racing manager, would you would you have stayed with a trainer in that situation? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with one's uh, financial position. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and I'm not making any assumptions. I don't have a list of those people, but uh, presumably a good percentage of them uh, are quite well off financially. And that's not to suggest that winning a derby would not have a meaningful impact on them financially. But if their horses don't go to the derby, if they're good enough to have potentially won the derby, they're going to be winning big races uh, later in the season elsewhere. They'll have plenty of value, even if they sacrifice some value I can I can see why someone who's worth uh, tens or hundreds of millions or more uh, would uh, who who has strong feelings about look this Bob's my guy he's mm-hmm. done right by me I think what Churchill uh, this is not me talking <laughs> I think I think that what Churchill has done is is wrong and I want to make my voice heard and this is how I'm going to make it heard mm-hmm. you know screw them mm-hmm. uh, even if my horse can't go to the Derby I'm sticking with Bob yeah. I'm like you, John. I give them credit for 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 having having the you know the 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 courage to do that. I'm only making the qualification that it's a lot easier to have that courage if you have a lot of money. <laughs> that's, well for, that's for damn sure. I think that's just a a, a good sentiment for life in general. It's a lot easier <laughs> to take bold stands on things if you're not worried about making rent the next month. Um, yeah. You know, b- b- before we wrap, I, n- I know there's some other things you wanted to, to get to, Tink. Uh, we had, you know, I, I'm mad at you for making me watch this whole thing, but we had the interview <laughs> with Mike Raboli and Pat Cummings the other day on, on Jonathan Kinchin show. And it was, it was illuminating after about an hour or so. It was illuminating to finally get some semblance of a direction or a vision for the NTA. And the, the uh, first issue that they settled on tackling is aftercare which I think is an extremely noble mission to, cause you know, there's, I think there's nothing more important and more lacking, I would say in this business in terms of major issues and taking care of the horses than what we do with them after they're done racing. Uh, just a quick thought on that interview and that kind of being the first flag they plant in the ground for the NTA. Yes. I, I think we can all agree that aftercare is an extremely important issue and that it's admirable that Mike from the beginning has been championing uh, the, the issue uh, and is, and has put, has put up you know, his own money and is willing to, to take steps that, that may not be so easy for others in the industry, other owners in the industry to take. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't have anything negative to say about that at all. I think it's, I think it's terrific. And this is another example. People think, well, I've been sparring with Mike Rapoli online. Yeah, we have been sparring, but I have never been monolithic in my view of Mike Rapoli. Uh, I, I know he's passionate. I share his passion. And when he first introduced the NTA, you know, I said that, that I support a lot, a lot of his goals. Let's see what happens. Uh, I was skeptical of some, but, you know, the practicality, but I support, you know, a lot of the goals. Anyhow, so it's understandable to me that the aftercare issue is what he emphasized. And I think the reason is that it seems to be the only one on their current agenda that is likely to be potentially solvable, at least in the in the near term. Uh, so and, and I don't blame them for focusing on that 
for that reason. But of course, it does raise questions about just how practical things like uh, uh, the mayor cap and uh, the super trainer issue and and other issues that uh, uh, the wagering issues, uh, you know, how, you know, how practical some of the some of the solutions that have been floated thus far may be. Right. Um, so that was, uh, you know, I think a, a, a big takeaway. Now, you know, the other point that that, of course, uh, is related to my sparring with Mike over the past uh, several weeks is his consistent vilifying of the the jockey club. And uh, he took this opportunity again to to reiterate um, how uh, how much he dislikes the organization. Quote, I'm against the jockey club. We don't need them. It's a club, not an entity. They're irrelevant. They're not part of the future. They're useless. We have to look at them as a non-factor in the future. We know it's not part of the solution. So they're actually part of the problem. Well, uh, setting aside the, the black and white aspect of that, which seems to be uh, very extreme, and also the dissonance that I've pointed out many times uh, with with that kind of approach to a major organization, a powerful organization in the industry, uh, and what he said he wanted to do initially when he introduced the NTA last October, I believe it was. Um, the The other oddity that that popped up in this particular podcast was that in stark contrast to the jockey club, he talked in glowing terms about the Breeders' Cup. And the reason, as I posted, uh, and and thanks to uh, someone who's been corresponding with me privately for uh, raising this this issue in my mind, I hadn't uh, seen it myself initially, But the oddity is that of the 14 board members of the Breeders' Cup, nine of them are also members of the Jockey Club. In fact, Barbara Banke is the Breeders' Cup chairman and is a Jockey Club steward. Anthony Beck, Breeders' Cup vice chairman, Jockey Club member. Bill Farish. Uh, Breeders' Cup Board of Directors, Jockey Club Steward, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes it even more difficult to easily understand uh, why Mike would be so unhappy with the Jockey Club and essentially dismissive and yet embrace the Breeders' Cup. Tough to understand. You know, the other thing I would say, and and I I do think that going after aftercare is as the first Mm -hmm. To, as as the first thing to tackle is very smart because this should be an easy one, you know, yeah. and he, and Mike said it very well. I think that if you're not for contributing more to take care of horses after they're done racing, we don't want you in racing. And I, you know, I, I don't usually don't like black and white de- declarations like that, but this should be something that everybody in the industry can get behind. And I, I you know, I, I think that, that that makes sense to start with something that should be such a unifier for people in the business if they care about the horses. The other thing that jumped out to me, and, and I'll toss it to John, but watching that interview is I honestly think it's ironic. If you combined Mike Rapoli and Pat Cummings, like, you would have the perfect spokesperson for the sport because I think Pat has a tremendous uh, discipline, a tremendous commitment to facts uh, and messaging. I think that that's something that he's he's very, very good at. Now, he doesn't have the personality that Mike does. You know, he he's he you know, he doesn't jump out when you're listening to him as someone to really rally behind that. Mike Mike does have that gift. Now, Mike, on the other hand, has the. The, the weaknesses that Pat doesn't have, which is he's a bit of a loose cannon, hard to keep on like one topic on message. So at least in that sense, I do think that the NTA has potential because the two guys running it have significant strengths. And if they could just offset each other's weaknesses, then I think you might have something because that really that really stuck out stuck out to me that like those two guys together, I think, would be the perfect spokesperson to rally people in the industry to to tackle these hard issues. Go ahead, John. I think that's a very good point, Joe. It, it, and, and uh, you know, it, it's kind of to me, it's kind of ironic because the the initial 
uh, thrust of this organization by Mike was to increase dialogue and talk about problems and how to fix them. And he even reiterated that again on, on this most recent podcast. Um, but then he pivots away from that message immediately. And, you know, if you are against any of his thoughts, then you're, you know, a, a persona non grata. If you argue with him on Twitter, which is the easiest way to get his attention, um, you get vilified. And his messages are all over the board to the point where, like, a couple of days ago, he went out and, and tweeted that basically I'm paraphrasing. But if you're other than him as the commissioner, <laughs> if you're over the age of 50, you don't need to bring ideas to the table. Yeah. OK, so, you know, that that basically gets rid of his entire brain trust of seven people who make all the decisions with him uh, or feed him all the information to make the decisions on who he's buying, who he's breeding to, how he markets. So, again, it, it's nonsensical as far as, you know, is this, this is well thought out. That part's not well thought out at all. Um, I'm very happy that they're going after aftercare because it's something that we've championed for for years. Um, there's multiple options, I think, to help uh you know establish fund and help pay for these horses afterwards um you know he, he went in and said i'm not i'm not buying a fucking two-year-old okay he also said that about the yearling sales so time will tell as to whether or not that that that's really going to happen um but the other thing that stuck in my craw and maybe it's just because it's personal um was like at minute 34 um he went on a rant about name another owner who's as vocal as i am name another trainer who talks and and makes comments like me or the media nobody else does and i immediately had like flashbacks of of a trump situation where you know no i'm the only disruptor in the world i'm the only one that can do this and just if you ask people they'll tell you hey you're doing a great job they'll say it privately but that, you know and it's like enough already you're not the be all and end all you are a great mount you have a great opportunity to say things but i think there's a few people who owners trainers and on the media who have who have kind of knocked the status quo and have kind of said not kind of have said we need to have a new system because the way we're going now it, it's a race to the bottom not a way to encourage conversation so I, I guess if if i was listening to the message which is let's all get together and try to hash things out that's the message i can get behind if you listen to how off-putting it is and how inconsistent it, the message is put out there, it's hard to get behind this situation. Yeah, uh, and look, I agree completely, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're all rooting for him, but mm -hmm. his his methods have been uh, have been uh, peculiar at times and and difficult to reconcile with the the stated goals. Um, you know, I look, I I hope if if he only is able to uh, really resolve uh, the aftercare issue. And he said to me in a tweet, we'll do it in six months. And he tweeted today or yesterday. Uh, you know, and as I said to him, I don't care how long, if, if you're able to get it done, I will gush praise on you. I, 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 right. I'm rooting for him as hard as anyone. Absolutely. So, you know, just, just like these other issues that I touched on, it's, it's you know, try not to, fall into the I'm speaking to you know some listeners <laughs> try not to fall into the trap of saying oh this guy you know is uh, hates Rapoli or or uh, hates Baffert or or loves the jockey club or blah 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 it, you know all of the all of the industry's problems are nuanced mm -hmm. and if you want to talk if you want to talk about them seriously if you want to help to to make progress uh, in resolving these problems you have to think about it and talk about it in in some kind of nuanced fashion. And, you know, I hope that uh, that we're all able to, you know, to make some progress in the coming months and years. For sure. And I think the the one thing he said that that really stuck with me and resonated with me as, as I think true and uh, very morally right is if you're paying a million dollars for a horse and you can't sign twenty five hundred bucks, at the ticket, at the at the auction, at the sale to go towards aftercare, you don't need to be spending a million dollars on a horse. I think that's the thing to take home is that there is a lot of money in this industry. We are not hurting for rich people in horse racing. So the fact that we have so many horses coming off the track that don't have second homes or have a murky future is totally unacceptable. And I think that that's something that we can all agree on. 
Tank, man, this has been great. I, this, these conversations just get better and better every single time. So we appreciate you reaching out and, and wanting to come back on. And now I can also call you Tony. Tony, you're the man. We appreciate the time. Always good to chat with you. My pleasure. It's been, uh, I agree. Each, uh, each podcast has been better than the last. And while there'll probably be a ceiling at some point, I hope we can, we can keep going. So uh, it was a pleasure and I uh, look forward to the next time. Let's keep doing it. We'll break right through that ceiling. Yep. And, and if we can't break through the ceiling, we'll just put you back at witness protection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who knows? I may need it. There may be a, a, a skeleton in, in a closet that I completely forgot about. We'll see. <laughs> Don't buy that camera just yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's going to do it for episode 34 of Rail Talk. Tink slash Tony is such a great guest. He gave us two more episodes in one sitting. And I'm sure this isn't the last time we're going to be talking to him. Shout out to Tink and Tink and Tony for coming through. I don't, I don't know which one to call him now, John. It's just, it's, I like both names, but I uh, appreciate his time as always. And the conversations just keep getting better and better. We hope you at home are enjoying them as well. So thanks to Tinky. Thanks to John Green. Thanks to our producer, Patty Wolf. Thanks to our associate producers, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson, and Julia Agresta. And big, big shout out to the sponsors, Basic Tip Tim, the Green Group, and Taylor Made for their constant support. Love you guys. We'll see you next week back here on Rail Talk.